Um, I get to take you up to lunch, and apparently, thanks to Julia and the previous speakers, we've gained about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if I can expand this talk by 10 minutes, so if you're lucky, you might get an early lunch. Uh, for those of you who remember last year, I was actually talking about stuff related to my day job, which is containers. Um, this year, I'm talking about stuff which is related more to a hobby project, um, which is uh, crypto enabling for the TPM uh, uh, sorry, the trusted platform module. Um, this isn't entirely now a, a hobby anymore because one of the things that you find as you go on an open source is that what you're interested in as hobby projects eventually become your day job. So now, right at the moment, I'm doing quite a bit with the TPM and containers, um, not really because it was my initial job description, just because I thought that somebody should be paying me to do it, so I sold it to my boss at IBM as relevant to my current job. Um, you've probably all seen uh, my resume, so I have been a container evangelist for quite a long time, uh, been an open source advocate for a very long time. Um, I dabbled a bit in converting businesses to open source, which is how I got interested in containers, because that was parallels. And I'm still technically a kernel developer. Uh, SCSI subsystem maintainer is almost just titular now. Um, Martin Peterson does most of the heavy work in that subsystem. I just uh, field patches to Linus and explosions that come back. Uh, peer risk architecture maintainer is something that I think I'm still listed as, but I haven't really done any substantive contributions for a while. Although, actually, they're just about to modify the uh, page table insertion handlers, which is one of my pieces of handiwork, so I might be diving back in there. And then, obviously, I've been doing containers for a long time. But to get onto the thing that we're actually supposed to be talking about, which is TPMs, uh, let's do a little aside on security and trust. So everybody needs help protecting secrets. This is no secret. Um, usually, when we say secrets, especially when we're a technical group, what we actually mean are some type of public-private key pairs, usually either RSA or ECC. Uh, ECC being elliptic curve cryptography, for those of you who don't know, although the term has been fairly universal now for several years. Um, in almost all of your walks of life where you use these types of keys, be they SSH keys or GPG keys or some other type of key, what they actually do is represent your identity online. So if any of these keys get stolen or misused, you yourself can actually be impersonated. How badly impersonated depends on how much credence you've actually been giving to the key, but I know people who claim that GPG keys, for instance, can be used to sign contracts, and if you're actually making that use of a GPG key, what that would mean is that if someone manages to uh, abscond with your private GPG key, they can actually impersonate you on legal documents, which is uh, pretty bad. So, part of the objective of anybody who uses these electronic keys as identity representatives is that you want to take all reasonable measures to ensure that they can't actually be misused. And the current state of the art is uh, expensive and often proprietary hardware security modules like USB keys. Uh, how many he people here actually have a USB key, something like a Neo or that's about half the room, that's pretty good. Yeah, I'll be calling on you later. Um, usually to demonstrate one of the problems of this, my go-to full guy is Ted Cho, but he's not actually here. Uh, he has a key ring that has about 11 uh, uh, Neo keys on it for all of the different keys that he carries. The problem with these USB key dongles was that they pretty much only carry one key, although the newer ones uh, that are used for GPG actually can carry three now. But the number of keys that these things carry is severely limited. Uh, the reason I mention this is because when I look at the number of keys I have just on this one laptop, it turns out that I've got two VPN keys, um, I've got four SSH keys, uh, I actually have three GPG keys because of the way I use GPG with subkeys. Um, 
I have one key for the domain hierarchy that I use for the web server, and I've got another couple of keys for more domain hierarchies that I use for trust and other things. So on my laptop currently, I've got about 12 keys. 12 keys is beyond the capacity of almost any USB key that I know currently. And one of the reasons that I was actually interested in using a TPM instead of a USB key dongle is that TPMs actually scale way beyond sort of tens of keys. They can actually scale to thousands of keys, which makes them actually very useful bits of equipment. So to look at the TPM basics, um, a TPM is basically a separated security processing module, and um, there's nothing incredibly special about it. It's just a security processor. The really useful thing about it is that almost every one of you sitting in this room have one in your computer. Um, the only computers nowadays that are actually delivered without a TPM are Apple computers, and nobody here would use one of those. So it's uh, quite an easy problem to solve. They look roughly like that. They're a small discrete chip. Um, uh, they've been ubiquitous for a long time now. So that chip that I'm showing there is TPM 1.2. Uh, as you can tell by the TT 1.2 figures, so it says TPM 1.2 in the middle as well. Um, almost every laptop for the last 15 years has had a TPM 1.2. Thanks to Microsoft, TPM 2.0 is the up and coming thing. If any of you have a newer Dell XPS laptop, chances are you actually have TPM 2.0 now. The main problem with the TPMs is there has always been somewhat of a desire to use them in Linux, but the programming experience has always been so horrifically bad that anybody who began life by desiring to use them usually ended up actually never wanting to see them ever again. Uh, the mandated model that we have for actually using the TPM is something called the uh, Trusted Computing Group Secure Stack, which is uh, abbreviated as TSS. And it looks like that. Uh, this is actually what the stack looks like for TPM 1.2. I know this is too small for you to see. Don't bother actually trying to see it. The main point I'm making is that it's pretty complicated. There is a huge amount of stuff that goes into the stack. Um, one of the biggest, nastiest things is this TSS core services, which, which is actually a daemon that runs on your system and controls the TPM. The Linux TSS 1.2 implementation is called Trousers. Uh, how many people have actually heard of Trousers? Yeah, very few. The problem with this is that Trousers was completed in 2012 and has since bit rotted and atrophied since then. However, it's currently the only way on Linux you can actually use TPM 1.2, and this means that if so few people have heard of it, almost nobody is programming security systems for TPM 1.2, and I think most of the blame lies with the fact that Trousers is pretty much almost unusable. Um, it reduces this model that the TCG has fair to, to a nice simple one. So you have an application, you link it with the trousers library, the central daemon is there, the TCS daemon, and it talks to the in-kernel TPM driver. It all looks fairly simple. Um, the idea is that um, you use an HMAC authentication system which is computed inside the trousers library. So in theory, the TCSD has no secrets um, and everything therefore just works. Unfortunately, in practice, this is incorrect. Uh, the control flow through the library to the daemon to the TPM means that any information that the TPM has to give you back in the clear, chances are the daemon actually knows what it is. So this makes the daemon a central point of attack for anybody seeking to run off with TPM-based secrets. And this is unfortunately a somewhat bad design. And for my day job, which is running containers in the cloud, this design is completely unacceptable. You cannot have multiple cloud tenants sharing a single daemon that knows all of their secrets uh, because we promised the, the, the cloud tenants that we wouldn't do anything daft in security terms, and this counts as being daft in security terms. So eliminating the central daemon is one of the big quests that I have for actually making the TPM usable in the cloud. 
So the idea is that for TPM 2.0, we can actually do much better than the TCG model. And this is a very heretical idea. Um, how heretical depends on where you come from. So there are large swathes of industry that believe in the certification process that will not accept anything that is not the TCG model. Um, fortunately, there are large freewheeling sections of industry, also known as Linux, which are perfectly happy to use any programming model that actually works, and the simpler the better. So if we go back to looking at what a TPM does, the actual TPM functions are things like shielded key handling, which is what I'll be talking about today. But the ones you've probably heard of are more about trusted operating systems. These are things like measuring, boot measurements of the operating systems. Data sealing, which we use within the kernel for the TPM trusted keys, but I won't really be talking about today. Attestation, which is used to prove a measurement. Um, and various other things that it can do. So the TPM itself is a fairly complicated beast. Cryptographic key handling is just one small part of what it can actually do. So, and that's the only bit I'll be talking about today. So this talk is not about trusted computing, which is all the other functions of the TPM. Um, keys in the TPM are stored in what are called hierarchies with a well-known key at the top. By well-known key, what I mean is that the TPM itself knows the private key and it will publish or give to you the public key when you ask. And therefore, this public key can be used to exchange secrets with the TPM. Um, asymmetric encryption keys, which are what we all really use for identity belong to the storage hierarchy. So the TPM actually has four hierarchies. The only one I'm going to care about today is the storage hierarchy. And for the purposes of this talk, you don't need to know anything beyond that. Um, one of the great features of TPM 2.0 over TPM 1.2 is this thing called algorithm agility. The problem with TPM 1.2 is that its hash is tied to being SHA-1 and its uh, asymmetric encryption algorithm is tied to being RSA 2048. Now, there's nothing wrong with RSA 2048. According to NIST, that's still good for another few years yet. But SHA-1 is already deprecated. SHA-1 is now an unacceptable hash for almost any security function because of the collision problems that have been proven. And this basically means that TPM 1.2, for most of its functions, is now technically unusable because the SHA-1 algorithm cannot be expanded in TPM 1.2. TPM 2.0 actually allows for pluggable algorithms, but in fact, most TPM 2.0s delivered today really only do, in addition to SHA-1 and RSA 2048, a certain set of elliptic curves and SHA-256 but that's good enough for them actually to be future-proof at least for another few years. And it's only a few years because apparently NIST is now on a bender to deprecate SHA-2. So uh, ultimately, TPM 2.0 is going to have to move on to the SHA-3 family of algorithms. SHA-2 is not deprecated today. NIST is just threatening that in a few years' time they might start to think about it. So TPM 2.0 generates an internal seed for its storage key. So TPM 1.2 2 used to generate an actual key to sit at the top of this hierarchy. The problem with TPM 2.0 is that because we have algorithm agility, we don't actually know what cryptographic algorithm we're going to use for the asymmetric keys. And so it can't generate a key to sit at the top of the hierarchy. It has to generate some random number which can be transformed into a key. And this random number is called a seed. And TPM 2.0 goes from the seed to the key via these things called key derivation functions. You don't really need to know much about them. They're basically just magic black boxes where you put a random number in one end and a key for a particular algorithm comes out the other end. Um, or actually, it's a key pair for the algorithm. But one of the problems with these is that um, for RSA, um, putting a random number in is fine. But generating RSA keys involves finding prime numbers. And prime numbers are somewhat difficult for a very low power processing engine to find. And this means that the TPM 1. Or TPM 2.0 can actually take a very long time to use a key derivation function to go from the seed to the RSA key. Um, the point about these key derivation functions is the same random number, if you feed it in, always generates the same key pair coming out. 
And this is an example of, this is actually an example of my laptop. When I ask it to generate an RSA key from the internal seed, it takes uh, just around 43 seconds, which is an unacceptable amount of time to be waiting around in your laptop. And so if you use RSA keys at the top for programming uh, keys into the TPM, chances are that you actually need a copy of this key already set up. You can't do the key derivation function every time because it will add an extra 50 seconds to every key operation you're going to do, which is completely unacceptable. The great thing, though, is that if you use elliptic curve keys, um, going from a seed to a key with an elliptic curve key is purely programmatic. It's basically a few tens of arithmetic operations. It's really fast. So for elliptic curves, key derivation functions work really well. For RSA keys, especially especially for slower TPMs like mine, they don't work so well. Um, the good news about this is actually, this is an XPS version one. This is the first Skylake XPS. Um, I went to Google a few months ago and did a comparison with Chad Cho. He actually has the second generation of these machines with a TPM 2.0 in it. His key derivation function is 10 times faster than mine. So his only takes four seconds to generate an RSA key. So eventually these key derivation functions will actually be pretty fast, we hope. But as I said, elliptic curves are much faster, and right at the moment, it's pretty much what I use in almost all of the crypto subsystems when I need to communicate secrets. Part of the problem with TPM 1.2 originally was there was no mandated way of actually storing the derived key from the primary seed, so you used to have to rederive it every time. Um, one of the useful things about the TPM is that the storage seed changes if the TPM is reinitialized. And if the storage seed changes, every key underneath that storage seed becomes unusable by that TPM. Effectively, it changes the TPM's identity. So this gives you a nice clean way of actually throwing away all of your keys when you're decommissioning this laptop. Um, because every TPM generates its own unique storage seed, every TPM in the room has a different one. And this means that when I generate the key for a particular TPM, it's always unique to that TPM. And if I change the seed at any point in time, the key I've generated then becomes useless. Uh, and like I said, the keys inserted into the TPM are encrypted based on the known public key parent, which is usually the parent. And this is unique to every TPM you actually have. And that means that those keys can only be decrypted by the TPM that's actually the one you converted them for. And so that the point about this for identity purposes is, if I have my identity that's TPM resident, it's represented by a file, but that file contains the TPM form of the key, Anybody can steal that file, but nobody can use it unless they actually have access to my laptop. So this actually locks the key to being used on my laptop and it can't be used anywhere else, which is what provides the additional security. Yep, question? It, it seems to me that the TPM is a standard device living in my uh, main board and it should have some software in it. Does anyone reviewed what is running inside the TPM to be sure that what is stored in it, there is no backdoor to read it again in a different manner? Okay, so for TPM 1.2, the answer to that question was no. For TPM 2.0, the TCG realized that there were, I mean, we have had faults in 1.2, the Infineon bug where it was generating weak primes is a classic example of that, which was due to sloppy manufacturing processes and sloppy software running within the TPM. So for TPM 2.0, they actually upped their game and started a certification program to try and prove through a test suite that all of the software that you've put into this TPM functions correctly. And in addition, for manufacturers that want to go this route, there's actually a reference implementation of TPM 2.0 as well, um, which is fully open sourced. It's actually written by Microsoft, but it's released under, it's, I think it's the BSD license, but it means that any manufacturer can actually use this reference implementation to create a TPM. And in theory, if they use the reference implementation, we have the open source ability to inspect it. However, most manufacturers see their value add, unfortunately, as being uh, sh 
sort of some of the short-circuited knowledge they have from TPM 1.2 as to how it works. So a lot of manufacturers don't actually use the reference implementation. So for them, the only guarantee you have is actually the TCG test suite. Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, once a key is transferred to TPM form, it can only be understood by the specific TPM it was transferred to, and it can't be tra extract transformed back. So it's a one-way transformation. You never get the key back. Uh, this means that if you're going to use a TPM for your identity keys, there is a problem because I expect my identity to live longer than my laptop. The lifetime of my laptop is only a few years. The lifetime of my identity should, in theory, be my whole life, which I'm hoping is more than a few years. Uh, depends how much more drinking I do at the parties here, but if I'm lucky, it will be. Um, and that means that I actually have to have a way of keeping my identity key, uh, the sort of private bit of it, somewhere offline, like on a USB key in a vault, that every time I get a new laptop, I can transfer it to TPM form on that laptop and then just use it on that laptop. But when I eventually decommission my laptop, I'll reinitialize the TPM so the storage seed changes so all those keys are useless, and then I'll go to my vault, extract my key again, and transfer it to my new laptop. And this is some... Uh, handling that people are not used to because usually when I transfer from one laptop to another I just do an rsync of all the directories and all of my key directories go with it but in that case none of the keys that were on my old laptop it's uh, possible to be used in the new laptop because they're all TPM form and so I have to go through this additional step of finding the real key and retransforming it TPM form so it involves slight somewhat more handling of uh, secrets than I've been used to in the past so if we look at TPM 2.0, uh, TCG is doing all of its TCG-like stuff for it. Um, the great thing about this is that this is the new version of the spec. And if you look, it has even more boxes than the old version of the spec. So if the number of boxes represents the lack of usability, the usability of this thing just went downhill. But at least it's keeping a lot of people in the TCG em employed. One of the problems of this is it's still not complete. So we're already shipping TPM 2.0, but the specification is still not finalized, which is really annoying if you want to use it. Um, one of the things that the specification actually added is what's called a resource manager, because TPM 2.0 now only has space for about three transient objects. Transient objects are how you load the keys. You, in order to use the TPM, you actually have to load keys into it, perform the cryptographic operation, and then flush the keys again. And if more than one application is doing this, they'll be loading up too many keys and the TPM will actually run out of memory. So we have a resource manager that actually virtualizes access to the TPM. And as of 4.12, the kernel itself takes care of this resource manager for TPM 2.0. So as long as you use the TPM via its resource manager device, you never actually have to worry about this now because the kernel will just do it for you. And Intel is actually building a TSS to the TCG spec. It's on GitHub under the Intel account. Um, the high-level eSAPI is actually required for encrypted sessions. So if I'm using the TPM to handle my private keys, I have to establish an encrypted communication channel between myself and the TPM to ensure that nobody is eavesdropping when I'm actually passing my secrets into the TPM. And this means that the eSAPI, which is one of the parts of the specification that is still technically not final, although it might actually be going final very shortly, is required. Um, and this lack of finalization of eSAPI means that the Intel TSS only acquired its eSAPI in March 2018. Uh, I was doing crypto enabling long before that. So it wasn't actually physically possible before March to use the Intel TSS for actually secure secrets handling because it didn't possess any of the cryptographic code necessary to establish secure channels to the TPM.
So that's why I actually used the IBM version of the TSS, because it's actually been fully and cryptographically functional since May 2015. But this gives you a flavor of some of the problems we have with TPM 2.0. Because the TCG has been slow, so slow producing the standards, there's actually a pl plethora of things that call themselves TSSs, but in fact aren't. This IBM thing is not a TSS because it's n it is not now and never will be blessed by the trusted computing group because it got out way ahead of their standard. But the good thing about that is it was functional when I needed it, which is why I used it. The nice thing about the IBM TSS is it's based on the TPM2 commands. It's not actually based on some abstracted standard that people actually find difficult to follow. And it does actually make a direct connection to the in-kernel resource manager. So the IBM TSS makes a direct connection straight from your application to the resource manager device. There's no daemon in the middle. Uh, the reason I like this is because there's no central thing that can actually possess your secrets. And that means that it's actually usable for the cloud use case, which is how I sold it to my bosses. So personally, I'm very happy with this. And like I said, until the merger of eSAPI uh, into the Intel TSS, the IBM TSS was the only choice for secure crypto. So to build a secure crypto system, you actually only need five TPM commands. TPM itself has about 150 commands, but you only need to know these five. There's a TPM create that gets the TPM itself to create an internal key. For identity keys, this isn't necessarily useful unless you have things like the GPG subkeys. So one of the things you could actually do is treat your GPG certification key at the top as the long-lived key that you keep. And every time you switch laptops, you revoke your old keys, create new subkeys, and get the TPM itself to generate those subkeys. Um, this is was thought to be the securest way of using the TPM because the private part of this key that you've created with TPM create never leaves the TPM. So this key is supposed to be invulnerable to interception because it was created inside the TPM. Unfortunately, thanks to Infineon, uh, the weak prime problem that we had for them means that nobody really entirely trusts the TPMs to generate keys anymore. And this means that most of the time, uh, I've actually, instead of generating a key on the TPM, I generate it using well-known algorithms outside the TPM and always import it. So to import an external key, we actually have a TPM2 import command. So these are equivalent commands. This one creates one inside the TPM, and this one exports an external private key from outside the TPM into it. Both commands return two structures. Um, a public key which also has all the visible parameters in TPM form, but it is still usable as a public key. You can transform it to a real live public key for whatever crypto system you're using. And a private key data blob which is itself only readable by the TPM. This data blob is actually symmetrically encrypted, so it's very fast to load and unload from the TPM. Uh, the key it's encrypted with is one of the TPM's internal um, AES keys that is actually bound to the storage route. And the public key is bound to the private data blob by hash, which means that you can't quietly alter some of the publicly visible parameters and expect the key to work. The TPM will check the binding every time you try to load the key. And both public and private parts have to be presented when you actually use the key. So when you use the key, there's a command called TPM to load, which loads the TPM form of the key. So these two commands, uh, either create or import TPM keys, but all they do is they take your external form for import or just some random thing in the TPM and spit back the TPM form of the key. Every time you want to use that key, you have to represent the public and private blobs into TPM load before you can actually execute any key commands. And the key commands are TPM to sign, which is a nice command because it's algorithm independent. And in theory, we also have a corresponding decrypt command, which we would use for things like uh, GPG decryption. The slight problem is that RSA and uh, elliptic curve have 
different ways of doing these decryptions. So because of this, we can't actually have a single generic command that's a TPM2 decrypt. So we have to have an RSA decrypt and a, an ECDH Zgen, which are just basically one is for RSA and the other is for elliptic curve. If we ever use the different encryption algorithm, chances are we'd probably need a new decrypt command as well to go with it. Um, so that means that the five commands are a slight lie. There are, in fact, six of them so far. And all the TPM2 keys are demand loaded, meaning they're not resident in the TPM, unlike USB keys. So the PKCS11 model is not really a good model for TPM keys. The file based model that OpenSSL uses is much more. Um, conformant with the way that the TPM expects to work because every time you use a TPM key it expects you to present it with these blobs and these blobs need to be stored somewhere. Storing them somewhere is your responsibility as the user, not really the TPM's responsibility. Unlike USB keys where it's the responsibility of the USB key itself to store your private key. And like I said, the user is manage, uh, responsible for managing these. And you require a resource manager because you can only load th three keys at once. So TPM security, this is becoming a big problem. Um, there's lots of sensitive information in the commands. Um, you can't be assured of a secure channel to the TPM. So the IBM TSS completely abdicates this. It uses the standard TPM security, which means that you actually are responsible as the user for setting up the secured channel ahead of time. The good thing about this is you know it was done correctly. The bad thing about it is you have to do it. And you have to secure all data in transit. Um, when TPM 2.0 came out, um, there was an easy button for all of this that was just a, we send stuff to the TPM in clear text because uh, the TPM is attached to an internal bus on your laptop. No one is going to be able to get that information. Well, it turns out about a year after we'd done this, somebody came up with an LPB snooping algorithm that actually uses another peripheral on that bus just to vector all the packets up to user space. So in general, you cannot rely that nobody is snooping on data in transit to your TPM, even on your private laptop. So everything has to be encrypted. And right at the moment, we're actually scrambling inside the kernel to encrypt everything because most of the TPM 2.0 uses in the kernel, which we use for initializing the random number generator, for instance, and we also use for uh, data sealing and the trusted keys, is currently all done in the clear because we assumed we were close enough to the TPM for it not to matter. And now, obviously, this is all completely wrong. We need to encrypt everything. This is actually the reason why the Intel TSS grew an ESAPI layer very fast in March, because news about the snooping algorithm dropped in March. They got advanced warning and realized they had to have all of this. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to secure traffic to the TPM. So in order to secure traffic to the TPM, you get this thing called a TPM2 start authentication session, which uses what's called a salt key. Is uh, basically you designate some known public key in the TPM to be the one you're going to begin the encryption of all of this traffic to. Um, the sessions are actually symmetrically encrypted, but you use these public asymmetric keys to derive a shared session key that you then communicate with the TPM over. And this sounds perfect, but there's a caveat to this. Um, uh, let's not bother with the types of the sessions. Um, uh, yeah, I've already described the bus snooping attack. So the problem is that uh, parameter encryption and response mean you actually have to have a known public key um, sitting in the TPM. And this m means if you want an RSA key to sit at the top of your storage hierarchy and use it for the salting of these parameters, you actually have to generate it because you're not going to be sitting around waiting the 40 seconds it takes the TPM to generate it. Um, however, if you want to use elliptic curve keys sitting at the top of your hierarchies, this can all happen nice and fast. Why would you want to use an RSA key? Well, it's just the one that everybody was familiar with. 
Um, I, I've got to confess, when I first started writing all the crypto routines, I did use RSA keys. Now, if you look at almost all of my enabling stuff, they all use elliptic curve keys at the top. Even if you're actually protecting an RSA key, I still use an elliptic curve key to communicate the information. Um, partly, it's due to um, the fact that, as a mathematician, I like to understand the cryptographic algorithms, and RSA is a very easy algorithm to understand. Elliptic curve is a lot less easy to understand. Although, I finally got to grips with the mathematics, so I finally understand elliptic curve keys and RSA keys. They're based, I mean, elliptic curves are nice, uh, but uh, don't fool yourselves into thinking that elliptic curves are really any different from RSA. The mathematical principle on which RSA rests, which is effectively the discrete logarithm problem, is the same mathematical problem that elliptic curve keys rest on. If that problem were ever solved, elliptic curve is blown in exactly the same way that RSA is blown. So, one of the problems if you're using the IBM TSS is that it does actually use all of the systems that uh, the TPM is using. And for reasons best known to the TCG, when you're using parameter encryption, it doesn't mean you encrypt every parameter. It only means you encrypt the first parameter of the command. Everything else is still in the clear. So for most TPM commands, this doesn't matter, but we do have a specific problem if the secrets you're passing in are not in the first parameter of the command. And if you were actually noticing when I was doing it, the TPM import command, for reasons best known to the TCG, has the public parameters as the first actual parameter. The thing with the at is just the handle, it doesn't count as the parameters. And so this is the wrong way around. The private key is the second parameter, not the first. It wouldn't be encrypted. And the TCG needed to find a way around this. And being the TCG, um, if it had been me, I'd have just swapped the two parameters. But they decided the best way of doing this was actually to introduce a first, uh, another first parameter, which is an encryption key, which will now be encrypted as it goes in. This is a symmetric encryption key, and it's actually used to encrypt the private key. So we now have a mechanism for actually securing private keys as we load them into the TPM. A uh, slightly complicated double-step encryption mechanism thanks to the TCG, but it's just annoying, it's not unusable. Part of the problem is how do we hide this complexity from the average user? And this is where crypto system enabling comes in. This is sort of the whole point of the talk. So everything else was just the introduction. Encrypted. Existing crypto systems mostly use password protected key files. And it turns out these password protected key files are the perfect paradigm for TPM keys because the key file can be used to store the actual blob the TPM needs and the password can just be used as the authority you pass into the TPM to prove you can use the key. And so these, all of these crypto system key files can very easily contain TPM keys. And then as long as the crypto system recognizes the TPM key, everything just works. The only requirement is that you have this additional step of converting your password protected private key from its password, whatever form it is for the crypto system, into its TPM form. That's the only thing. And you obviously require some discipline around key backup and handling because once you've transformed a key to its TPM equivalent, you do not get it back again. So the advantages are obvious. You only need to trust the TPM. Uh, keys can never be stolen, even if the authority can be misused. So this means that if someone wants to impersonate you, they now require your laptop and the authority you use for the key in order to actually get a signature out. So this means that if someone is actually trying to hack and impersonate your identity, they have to do it on your laptop if you have a TPM key. And the good thing about that is that you have the opportunity to detect them while they're doing it. They can't do it offline. They can't just steal your key file and use some other laptop to impersonate you. And apart from the key conversion to TPM form, no other changes actually need to be done to key file workflow. Once the conversion is done, you can use a TPM key file in exactly the same way as you'd use any other key file in any other crypto system. The disadvantages are obviously that the key is tied to a single physical TPM, which is part of your laptop. If the laptop is lost, damaged, stolen, broken, blown up, or uh, uh, eaten by the luggage handling system, all of your keys are lost. You have to reconvert them. 
And obviously, when you change laptops, even a planned change, they still have to be converted. TPM 2.0 does require the in-kernel resource manager, which means that it will not work for any kernel less than 4.12. This is getting to be less of a problem nowadays. And the TPM is slow, which means it cannot process hundreds of key operations a second. You only really use it for the important asymmetric identity operation. For instance, most of you will have disk encryption on your laptops. The TPM is not going to be used for disk encryption because it is simply not fast enough. If you want to wait weeks for your data, you could obviously use the TPM, but if, like me, you get impatient if your laptop doesn't boot within a few seconds, you can't, it's too slow. So the current status. OpenSSL engine is done. So this is actually a pluggable engine for OpenSSL that can be used with TPM2. This engine is actually quite sophisticated now. Thanks to Roberto Sasu of Huawei, we even have TPM key policy for this. So we can make TPM keys that are time limited, we can tie them to PCR values, and we can do other neat things with the policies. It comes with a create TPM2 key utility, which is what we use for key conversion almost everywhere. Um, we do have some elliptic curve issues. TPM enabling works just fine. Uh, the TCG had a problem with export. It turns out that most of the world's um, NSA-like authorities have certain elliptic curves they like and certain elliptic curves they don't like, corresponding to what they think they can decrypt and what they think might be compromised by other NSA-like security agencies. This means that the TPMs themselves don't have generic elliptic curve handling routines because if they did, they wouldn't be exportable to places like China and Russia. TPMs in China have to use the China NSA approved algorithms. TPMs in Russia have to use the Russia NSA approved algorithms. And so this means that every TPM comes shipped with a set of elliptic curves that it can use. Um, and the curves must be known to the TPM. The, currently, the two mandated ones are BN256, the burrito nairing curve, which nobody really uses, and NISTP256, which is the one generated by the NIST organization, which obviously everybody trusts because the NSA had a hand in creating it. The problem is that the Bernstein curve, which is the standard one we use in GPG, isn't actually even on the TCG radar. Although we finally got a request into the TCG that they add the Bernstein curve. And since the Bernstein curve is published worldwide, it looks like even the Chinese and the Russian security agencies may accept it as an addition to the TPM. But right at the moment, the TPM that sits in my laptop only speaks these two curves, Brito Nairing and NISTP256. There's a problem with OpenSSL, which is due to the OpenSSL API. Um, there isn't just a file load API for the OpenSSL. There's actually a file load API for every different format of file you have. So there's a different one for PEM files than from DIR files than from engine files. And so just adding an a OpenSSL engine is not necessarily sufficient because lots of OpenSSL using projects forgot to actually add the engine load um, part of the API, which means that they're not actually capable of making use of engine-based keys. Um, however, it's usually only a couple of extra lines in the OpenSSL consumer code, and it's fairly simple to do. I've got conversions done for OpenVPN, OpenSSH, and uh, G GPG is not actually OpenSSL based, it's actually libgcrypt based. So one of the things that I did last year, Werner Koch was here, and he asked me to see if I could actually look at doing a TPM conversion for GNU PG, which is now actually ready to go. And um, in GPG, the conversion is done simply via GPG edit key, and there's an additional command that's key to TPM. Once you type that on any of your keys, they're instantaneously converted to TPM format. That makes it actually very easy to do. Uh, I think I still have 10 minutes left, so we will uh, see if I can do the demo. Uh, actually, let me just bring that back. To do the demo, we will do Okay, let me break it bigger, uh, too big. Is that readable by everybody? 
Okay, so let's demonstrate the thing which didn't exist last year that now exists, which is GPG. Let me just check that, yeah, okay, so I've erased my own GPG directory, which I use to store my private keys, and we'll actually try and just do a quick generation of the key. Uh, we'll call it James, because that's me. Uh, my passphrase will be test. Uh, you should not use this passphrase for any of your keys <laughs> as a matter of security. But now what I've done is I've created a um, standard uh, key. And I've got um, an RSA 2048 uh, certification key, which is also used for signing. And I've got a... Um, encryption subkey, which is also RSA 2048. This is the standard way that GPG gen generates keys. But now I have these keys, um, and uh, if I look at these keys, let's see what the key grips are. Let's just come out of this, go into my newly created new PG directory with the private keys, and let's have a look at my primary my certification key. So this is the actual S expression format of the key. What you can see there is that this is protected by a AES CBC encryption algorithm. And this string of numbers here actually represents the private key. So this is my encrypted private key in GPG form. What I'm now going to do is edit this key. And I will convert my primary key sitting at the top to TPM form. So I don't even need to specify a key. If I don't specify a key, it will act on my primary key. It will ask me to confirm I want to convert the primary key. In order to transform it to TPM form, I need the raw private key. So first of all, I need my passphrase to decrypt the key file, which was test, which is a passphrase you should never use. And now I'm going to have to give it a TPM authority phrase, which will be passed into the TPM to prove I should be using this key. I will use the phrase TPM. Uh, you would be unfortunate if you thought that that was the phrase I used for all of my TPM keys. Again, it's one you shouldn't use. You saw there was a slight delay because this is an RSA key. But now if you look at it, it's actually using the card the, it looks like it's got a, a card resident key, except instead of the card serial number, I have a phrase which says TPM protected. So now my top level certification key is actually TPM protected. And if I quit from this and actually use GPG protect tool to show you what that key looks like, now you can see that it's a shadowed format TPM2 key, version one just means that's the only one I have. These three numbers here actually represent the parent, the public key, and the private key blob. So now embedded inside my GPG directory, I have the TPM form of my key. You notice that conversion was instantaneous, which means that that key I created, I did not get a backup copy of. So I now can only use this key on this laptop. I can't transfer it anywhere else because I have lost the actual real uh, form of that key. I only have the TPM form left. So if you were doing this in the real world, before you converted your GPG to TPM form, you needed to have backed it up, which is a step I didn't do. But now, um, let's just prove that we can do interesting things with elliptic curves. What I'm actually going to do is create a signing elliptic curve key. That's ECC sign key. Um, now here I get a list of curves. So uh, GP, uh, GPG is pretty good. It has uh, the one it prefers is the Bernstein curve, 25519, but it has several NIST curves, it has the brain pool curves and everything else. There's only one curve on this list that my TPM understands. So if I want to convert this key I create to TPM form, I'm actually obliged to choose the NIST P256 curve, which is curve three. And it will expire, and let's prove that it's all correct. I'll really create it. I'll use the phrase test again, don't do this at home. Uh, oop, sorry. I actually typed an extra letter while I was doing that. James. And 
and this time I will be more careful when I repeat the passphrase. And now, in order to attach this key to my certification key, I need the TPM passphrase of the certification key because that's already TPM converted. So I now type that, and this key will now be actually attached to my key as a secondary signing key, which is now NISP-P256. This current key is actually not in TPM form. It's just in standard encrypted form which I could prove to you by coming out of here, saving the changes, and uh, having a look at this. It's the 3.7 key. And one of the great things about elliptic curve keys is they are so much shorter than RSA keys. This is really tiny. This is actually a properly encrypted elliptic curve key. One of the things I can now do is edit this again, and if I select this subkey, which would be subkey 2, I can now convert this one to TPM format as well. So I need my test passphrase, and then I'll give it a TPM passphrase, which I'll actually make TPM again. And now my signing, my signing subkey is also TPM protected. So let's demonstrate that. Uh, I'll just sign a simple file. This signature has to now go through the TPM, but the hash will be computed outside the TPM. It's only the hash that will actually be passed in. You notice it's asking me for my TPM key passphrase because it knows this. And the encryption occurred fairly rapidly. Yeah, question. Could you bring up the, could you bring, could you, bring, could you bring up the list of encrypted curves again, uh, of elliptic curves again? The ones that my TPM understands or the ones that... The ones that G, uh, GPG understands. Yeah. Uh, what happened to two? Oh, I think it was uh, a NIST P192, which is now deprecated. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, so what did I do? I signed it. I believe I signed it. Okay, so let's just verify... I got the signature right, and it says I gave it a good signature. That signature was created by the TP TPM, and it was an ECDSA signature, which is an elliptic curve signature. So this is actually using the TPM to do elliptic curves. And with that, we have, oh gosh, well, I suppose you won't get an early lunch, but if I leave 10 minutes for questions, you'll still get a lunch on time. We'll go back to the... Um, Presentation. And the conclusions. So the TPM can be an externally trusted security boundary within your laptop, effectively equivalent to two-factor authorization. Once the TPM the keys are converted to TPM form, they cannot be extracted from your laptop. They can only be used in situ. Um, if we standardize this scheme for the industry in easy form, which is crypto system enabling, we can actually drive the security argument that you should be using a TPM. So although I showed you all of the complexity of using a TPM during this talk, the actual use case that I showed you with GPG was very simple. It was one additional command, which is key to TPM, nothing else. As long as you remember to back up your key before you convert it, it should be very easy for ordinary people to use. And it already just works for OpenSSL, VPN, OpenSSH, GPG2, SB Sign Tools, GNU Keyring, everything. Oh, that's the other key I forgot. My secure boot uh, signing key is also TPM resident here. And so with that, if you've enjoyed the presentation, I'll just say that it was presented using ImpressJS. Makes me a web developer rather than a kernel developer. It does make me the only kernel developer willing to admit to being a web developer. And with that, I'll say thank you and call for questions. So, any questions that weren't asked during the talk? Do we have any stack that does both TPM 1.2 and TPM 2.0 in the same library? Um, so the question is, 
do, uh, do we have the same library that has both of them? Yeah. Okay, so the answer to that is actually yes. It didn't used to be. Um, the reason for this is that we are busy at IBM, TPM enabling the cloud. It turns out that server systems lag behind laptops in the number of TPMs they have. So what we've actually been doing for our current TPM 2.0 TSS is actually adding a 1.2 layer just because trousers are so awful. Um, I do have an older laptop that also has TPM 1.2 using trousers. And the problem with it is the central daemon keeps crashing, and every time it does, all of my crypto functions collapse. The main one that's the problem for me is the VPN. So the answer to your question is yes, but it is very, very recent. And it won't last for much longer. TPM 1.2 is going away. It has to, because SHA-1 is no longer a trusted hash algorithm. That means that the TPM 1.2 will not be acceptable for a lot of government and NIST certified stuff pretty much starting today. Any other questions? Yep, one over here. Well, I must say this is amusing for the speaker. Would it make sense to pop a TPM onto a USB stick? So the question is, would it make sense to pop a TPM onto a USB stick? The answer is, well, people have already done it. So apparently to them, it does make sense. The problem it solves, which I presume you're thinking about, is the transferability between laptops. So your USB stick can go between laptops, and that means your TPM files can follow the USB stick. So the answer is, yes, it has been done. Um, it's, it's less useful well, the problem with doing it is that once you have a USB stick, people expect it to behave like PKCS11 because that's what all the other USB key dongles right. do, and it doesn't. You still need the key files. So then it becomes a slightly more complex use case than people are used to. But it can, it can be done, definitely. And actually, I believe there is one manufacturer who does supply a USB attached TPM. Thanks. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, I'll say thank you very much, and you still get five minutes early for lunch. <laughs>